Hey guys, it's Adam from this Pixel, and welcome back. Now yesterday, while surfing YouTube for something to watch, my timing was perfect because just as I was logging on, um, a bright aqua was being interviewed on Schoolism by Bobby Shu. It was they were about ten minutes into the into the interview at the time. It was live. So I jumped on and I started to watch it. And thankfully I had enough time to watch the whole thing. And needless to say, it was inspiring and it was awesome. Everything that everything that schoolism produces, everything that Bobby Chu produces is authentically inspiring stuff. And I've been a huge admirer of Bright's work for quite some time. I'll link the interview below, by the way, if you're interested. And as I'm listening to it, uh, towards the end, as they, as they started to approach the somewhat towards the, the end of the interview itself, Bobby Chu had asked him a question about how to, um, how to find motivation and stuff like that. A very kind of simple question, but Bright said something that really put a smile on my face. It was a quote, and it really made me think. It made me reflect on my own life and my own past. And the quote was, all of your treasure can be found in your trash. <laughs> when I heard that, I got a big smile on my face because it is such a powerful and meaningful and wise thing to, to say. And it's a wise perspective on life. But it's not something that is immediately evident, particularly when you're early off in your artistic career and you're trying to figure out if the decisions you're making are the right or the wrong ones, I'd say that one of the most, one of the most common thoughts I had misleading or discouraging or confusing thoughts that I had growing up as an artist was whether or not I was wasting my time, whether or not my dreams and aspirations were realistic and practical because they should be practical to a certain degree. You can't be too romantic or you end up being a romantic guy living under a bridge, right? Um, but at the same time, we are artists for a reason. And what make us who we are, what, what fashion us very often is this desire to express. It's this desire to keep faith in the magical side of the world and whether or not Santa Claus is real we like to make believe that he is so much to the point that we will will create will build on the mythology of something like that and we will find our own way of reinterpreting it through our own lens to keep the flame of imagination and keep the flame of lore and story and creativity alive. So you can't let go of this magic side of who you are. And it's for that reason that I very often find that one of the things that us artists struggle with through all of the trials and tribulations in our life, through all the, all of the challenges, emotional challenges and professional challenges that we encounter throughout the decades of our career that one of the things that we hold on to in a million different types of ways depending on the type of person and depending on the type of artist we are one of the things we fight hard to hold on to is our innocence is the purity of our being to a certain degree so when somebody challenges it, when bad relationships or bad employers or negative feedback or toxic online environments or anything like that, when anything comes in and starts to challenge it, something deep inside us makes a point of holding on to our innocence. And I see this in so many artists out there. I see this in my children. I see this in myself. I see this in my students. And I see it in a lot of you too. And the way I see it in you is through your comments, through, I, I pay close attention to what you say in response. And it's overwhelmingly clear how the thing that resonates with you is how you can relate to how much I, I focus on and appreciate the magic of life, 
the fantastical side of it. And I don't necessarily mean in the in the fictional sense. I mean it in the beautiful sense. I mean it in what are these little things about you and I and about the world we live in and about this universe we live in and about the things we love and enjoy that have soul, that have depth, that have meaning, that have richness, that that spark a flame inside of you. And where Bright comes in, where his quote comes in, is a place of wisdom, a place of age, a place of looking back at those periods in your life, those ups and downs, and where you hopefully will find yourself at the end of that trip when you do start to find success and you do start to find that your skill is good enough for you to start expressing yourself in a very fluid and enjoyable way. Because there's this, there's a, there are technical hurdles that we have to get over as an artist. We have to learn the language of art through the fundamentals. When it comes to characters, we have to learn about expressions and gesture and anatomy and the physics of how the human body works and how fabric flows and folds and how hair grows and reflectivity and different types of surface textures like eyeballs and skin and teeth, that kind of idea. There's all of these, these learning curves we have to go through at different points in our career. But when all of those fundamentals start to come together, they start to, they start to form something that's controllable. They start to form something that is manageable, that can, that can allow you to speak in a more fluid and exciting way. That's a very exciting moment in the lives of any artist out there. I remember when I could just let go and start to express. And that, oh, that reminds me of a quote that I bring up all the time, um, which is, learn the fundamentals of drawing so well that you can one day ignore the fundamentals and start focusing on the real thing, art. And art is that moment where the fundamentals become you. They become a part of your DNA. You don't think about them anymore. They're just forged into your technique and you manipulate those fundamentals and you cheat those fundamentals in your own unique way to create your own unique voice. You manipulate this tool to express yourself in your own unique way. And it gives you the sense of fluidity and control that's exciting. And that's where Bright's quote, where that, quote, that, that, that pearl of wisdom comes in. Because when I found myself at that point in my career, which you might have already experienced yourself, or maybe you're still aiming towards that because you're still working on your fundamentals. At that point, you realize, you discover that that innocence that you were holding on to with both hands through the storms, through the punishment, through the punches and kicks that you were getting from society, from people around you, that innocence was you holding on to the child inside you. And it's the child inside you that is the keeper of your voice. That child inside you is the keeper of your expression, of your uniqueness. It's all of those things that you grew up naturally and effortlessly loving and adoring, the things that, that you nerded out about. And I can see that so clearly in my kids, Lucas and Chloe and Emily, um, that I can see how the things that just they just love, the things that they nerd out about, like how Lucas is is nerding out about uh, you know, Breath of the Wild and he's a complete link fanatic. And we were playing we were playing Breath of the Wild the other day and we spent an entire hour and a half just walking around as Dark Link because he just got his Dark Link outfit and he was he would walk up to a wall and turn the camera around so he could just stare at the face for for an hour, <laughs> you know? And I didn't stop him. I didn't go, oh God, can we go and do something else? Because I could see, I could see that something in him was just loving what he was looking at. And I could relate to that. I've done that. I do that today when I'm playing cyberpunk and I'm decking out my character in some weird, you know, futuristic outfit. And I just look in the mirror and I have do all these funny expressions in the mirror and just 
look at the design and just appreciate that or look at the coat or the gloves or the boots or the gun or anything that he's using or the, the cars. Oh my God, the cars. I, I, I went around, I, I, I found this exploit for, um, you know, how to make money quickly, reselling a book over and over again. You might know what I'm talking about if you've been playing cyberpunk because getting money is a pain in the ass. And I went around buying all the cars, all the most expensive cars I could get. And I would just call a new car and just drive around it and play with the radio and just blast the music and go somewhere in the outlands and just drive full speed and just just enjoy nerding out with these cars and I'm not even a car fanatic I'm not, I don't even really give a shit about cars but this game makes you a car lover <laughs> and and that directly ties into what Lucas did that's the child in me that's just enjoying blasting music in my headphones and driving a fancy make-believe car or Chloe who's got literally got a shrine to Stranger Things literally she's got a wall full of Stranger Things books and posters she She's she's been rewashing and rewearing the same black hoodie, Stranger Things hoodie, all week long. She's completely obsessed. And Emily, Emily obsesses over everything. <laughs> Emily is a walking, breathing obsession. Everything she does is lives and breathes in this world of obsession over the things that she loves. Be it music, be it music production, being it playing music, being it drawing and painting. She is constantly, she's constantly drowning in an obsession and I grew up with parents like that I grew up with a mother like that who was who, every time she got into something that she was excited about it didn't matter what it was she went all in with it that included construction that included painting that included building her home and turning her house into like this Alice in Wonderland fantasy land with hidden doors and doorknobs and she got so much into construction and home renovation and stuff like that on her own as in as a woman at the time in her 70s when she was doing this she ended up buying a pickup truck she had an entire room that was dedicated to all of her tools and she remembers she, her telling me this funny story about how she was driving down the street in a pickup truck and she was driving through a t part of town that had prostitutes walking down the street and her as a 70 something woman driving down the street in a pickup truck she would drive by the prostitute and the prostitute would look look into the car to see if she was a she was a potential client and then when the woman would realize that it was a seven-year-old woman driving the car, she would quickly turn her eyes away, <laughs> you know? And I grew up in this world of, of people who obsessed and were heavily passionate in everything they did. And I'm so blessed that my kids and everybody around me have, have that bug, have that obsessive personality in a healthy way. They obsess over their imagination. They, they obsess over the things that they're passionate about. That is the child inside you. And as an artist, I have so much love and respect for people who, who don't take for granted that tiny, tiny little seed inside them that I see in so many other professions and so many other venues of life get snuffed out. Just people who have the seed inside of them. It's a very small seed of innocence that a lot of people call, you know, hopeless romantics and sensationalists and immature but those are the people that move the planet those are the people that can can ignite a flame in society and they remind people that we are more than just flesh and blood we're more than just our our material possessions and our financial accomplishments and uh, and how big our buildings are and how expensive our cars are that there's something inside of us that is potent and powerful and if if salvaged if you can if you can protect that small flame inside of you it can grow into something majestic and as an artist once those fundamentals, once you have mastered that language of the fundamentals, I can't stress enough how you start to rediscover the child inside you. The art that I create now is in so much part a reflection of a boy who never wanted to grow up. Even though you look at my stuff and it's about these very often these, these creepy, um, you know, I'm looking at my walls right now as I'm talking, but these creepy, make-believe, spooky, 
tragic, sad, melancholy type of environments sometimes or situations or stories. It's the kind of stuff that as a kid I was growing up going, whoa, it's the kind of stuff that as a kid I would think was kind of hardcore. You know, oh, a face is all decayed and I can see the teeth through the decayed cheek that's freaking gross and all. Oh, there's a centipede crawling around. The, there's something artistic. There's something expressive. There's something raw. There's something you can't hide from. There's something visceral. There's something magical about that that's just kind of fun. That's the, exactly the same kind of shit that I nerded out with as a kid. And I know I'm, I know you're listening to me right now, and I know you're sitting there nodding your head saying, yeah, I have that too. And you might be even getting emotional hearing me validate that. Because I get emotional when I talk about this kind of stuff. And I get emotional when I listen to and I see the art and, the, and I hear the music and I see the movies created by artists like Bright or Bobby Chu. Bobby Chu, to me, is a very special human being too because he's so connected to the child inside him. He's so, he's so effortless about his ability to visualize the things that so many of us can sometimes have blinders in front of us. The fact that he grew up feeling a little bit awkward as a minority, he felt a little bit awkward with his over or his underbite, and he how he was so open and vocal in such a wonderful way about how he manifested that into his creature designs. And every time I look at a painting by Bobby Chu, I always smile. I always look at his work. The one, the latest one I saw of his was the one where it's this little girl and she's handing lollipops to these little monsters and there's this little cute monster reaching up to get his lollipop and the other ones are sitting around licking them and enjoying them and I'm looking at that going god damn that's so good that's so satisfying to look at that and the reason why is because he that is a visual representation of the child inside of me it's so relatable in so many ways and executed in such a beautiful, artistically beautiful way. There's a purity to what he does because it is so honest and it's so, it's so connected to his soul. And the same thing applies to Bright. He's somebody who, and Bobby had asked him at a certain point around the time he answered that, he was answering that question. He was talking about how where he's from, there is no art community in the, in the in the ecosystem that he grew up in. There's no art community. There's there's nobody that supports an art community necessarily. That it's he really had to create his own little world. He had to create his own little ecosystem. And Bright was talking about how you have to be a little bit stronger. You have to be a little bit tougher. You have to be you have to push harder because. Um, it's very, if you aren't holding that, if you aren't protecting that flame yourself, it'll go out real fast because you're surrounded by hurricanes that are dying to blow that thing out. So you really have to protect it. And that takes a lot of, it takes a lot of conviction. It takes a lot of focus. It takes a lot of persistence. It takes a lot of strength. And he, here he is now. There he was, sitting down with Bobby Chu on a schoolism interview, being praised and commended for being such a trooper, for being such a hero, that he never let that flame snuff out. And that really is, to me, when you get past all of the, all of the fancy tech talk of growing and learning in your education and which school you went to and yada, 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 and what studio you worked at. In the end, it comes down to that. And that to me is what makes us as you, that, that makes the community of artists that we are and illustrators, a community of kindred spirits. We really do speak the same language. We really do get each other. So to Bright Aqua and to Bobby Chu, I dedicate this video to you. 
I want to thank you for, for in so many different ways, not only in your schoolism interviews, but your schoolism workshops, which I've been to two of them already, authentically, genuinely, and so beautifully keeping the flame of art and inspiration alive in an honest and authentic way, not in a businessy, you know, look at what a hotshot I am, look at what great accomplishments I have, just in such a humanitarian way, reminding us what makes us artists so special. So I love you both for that. And of course, to the rest of you, I love you as well with all my heart and happy painting. Take care.